during Jingi's presentation, I ask you all to keep your microphones muted. We will then have 15 minutes of Q&A. I will endeavour to share the questions between those in the hall and out there in Zoom land where you can ask questions by using the chat function to send a message to the off host that you want to ask a question or you can type your question into the message and Graham will read it out for you. Please mute your microphone after asking your question. We will then move into off general business items. The meeting is expected to take 90 to 100 minutes. Um, you are free to leave the meeting at any time up until the meeting is closed by the host. You can do this by clicking leave meeting. So our speaker tonight, we'll get straight on with it, is Jingyi Ding from the University of New South Wales. Um, she's a postgraduate student and a recipient of one of Hoff's research grants. Uh, you remember, recall uh, several years ago, we gathered all our donations together and uh, instead of um, making small donations to a large group of organisations, we pooled them and targeted um, research in the, uh, the fields of the objectives of Artly Flora and Fauna. Uh, and Jingyi was chosen to uh, receive one of those grants. And um, that comes, with, uh, a price comes with that, and that is we ask uh, our our researchers to give a presentation on their research. So Jingyi is here tonight and I'll hand over to her now to give her presentation. Welcome. Yeah, okay. Uh, hi, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming and the horrible weather. And uh, also, hello, all the people online. Uh, I'm Jingyi Jing. I'm a PhD student from University of New South Wales, and I'm doing a PhD. Uh, and uh, and uh, thanks very much for Australia Flora Fauna Society to give me uh, three thousand bucks to uh, help my research. It's very generous, and I really appreciate. And uh, also thanks for giving me an opportunity to come to the society and uh, share my results. Uh, so today I will talk about my PhD project. A response of woodland to increasing aridity. <laughs> Is the computer not happy now? <laughs> oh, no. It's in some of the device and solve the box and insert it into the computer first. Oh, I think I just use the computer. Yeah. Okay, sorry for the interruption. So, uh, yeah. yeah, so my uh, my major study object is woodland. So woodland is a major ecosystem in our Eastern Australia. Uh, so woodland generally have wide space of woody plants with open canopies. So we can see the picture on the left. It's a typical woodland that uh, uh, lots of us would see in the national parks and nature reserves when we go hard days or when we go bushwalk. <laughs> oh, okay, we blame for the weather tonight, so, okay, we can go on. So, uh, so basically, um, basically, the woodland occupies a large part of the land in New South Wales, and basically, all the bush away, away from the coast that we can see are woodland. And so it's very important uh, for our Eastern Australia. And it's also provided lots of good benefits to our humans, such as the timber production for the, our house, and also the material for our toilet paper, uh, and uh, the good place for our holidays and a beautiful habitat for our native animals. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, so however, uh, so the under the future climate change, 
the, uh, the climate is, is predicted to become drier with more frequent drought. And we can see from the uh, left hand side of this prediction map, the blue color means low risk of drought and the uh, red color means high risk of drought. And uh, we can see uh, our, the whole continent of our Australia is in the high risk of drought by the end of this century. So what does it mean? So it means in the future, if the climate is getting dry and the drought has long period of drought and we probably would have lots of trade dieback, like, like this, it's a river red gun dieback and we see in New South Wales. And we probably have seen a lot since the big drought happened in the past few years. And uh, the larger trade dieback will largely affect how much benefits we can have in the future. So it's very important to know how do these woodland respond to dry climate, and this this is my major topic of my PhD. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so my PhD uh, mainly study what what's the uh, uh, how the plant soil and the biodiversity in the woodland respond to the future dry climate, and uh, particularly for the plant. I study how the allometry changes in the individual trees and also uh, the special distribution of trees. So how they distribute it especially um, in the drier conditions. And also I study the soil results and the plants, how they changes and uh, with increasing dryness. And besides that, I also study the relationship between biodiversity and function to see whether they change as the climate getting drier. So you may ask, how, how do you do that? We don't know climate change. And uh, it's a good question. And I conduct that by doing a very extensive field survey. I have surveyed 150 sites uh, from our Sydney coast all the way to the Cooper Bar at the corner. Uh, and the different color in this map represents a different uh, climate zone based on the rainfall and evaporation. So as the color going from blue to red, it means the condition got drier with water limited. So that they are humid, dry subhumid, semi-arid and arid areas. And, and because monitoring climate change would need decades or even centuries, and it would cost lots of money, which is impossible for a PhD. So here I use a, a gradient of aridity. So um, because the climate is, becoming uh, drier as we go, go from the coast to the outback. So I use the, this gradient of aridity as a proxy of the dry climate. So that means, so probably sites in the arid area such as Poba and Burke can give us an idea how the sites in relative music areas such as Double and Orange, they would be like in, under the future drier climate. Yeah. So across this uh, huge gradient, I sampled the humid regions where the rainfall is above 800 millimeters. So uh, such as our Otterley Park, uh, Nathan National Park, Blue Mountains, King Cumber Mountains, all this, um, basically all this uh, nature reserve and national parks that are around the coast. <laughs> yeah, and I also uh, uh, sampled the dry subhumid area where, where the rainfall is above 650 to 800 millimeter, uh, such as our Wallamai National Park, uh, Cessna State Forest, and Ralston. And then we're going uh, further up back. Uh, I sampled uh, in semi arid area where the rainfall is between 300 millimeter to 650, uh, such as the sites like uh, Goulburn River National Park, uh, Gandabuka National Park, uh, and the uh, Malik Cliffs around the Majura. Uh, and finally, I go to the most arid area uh, where rainfall is below 300 millimeter, which is very dry, such as uh, Mongol National Park, Wingworth, and uh, Star National Park, that's near the corner.
So in each site, uh, we, because I surveyed 150 sites, in each site, I run a 100 meter transect. And uh, along this transect, I measured the canopy diameter and the stem diameter of uh, every trace along the transect. And also, I use the clinometer. That's uh, like a lintel uh, machine to measure the tray height from the distance. So that's all the, I collect all the data on the tray structure. So totally, I surveyed more than 6,000 trays across more than 100 species uh, along this huge gradient. So on the at each side, besides the tree structure, I also surveyed the uh, soil surface condition and the uh, uh, tree, shrub, grass, and open and the different patches. So, uh, so the soil surface condition, like uh, how much is the litter on the ground, how much uh, annual perennial species, and what's the crust stability, what's the stability of the soil like. And uh, then I also uh, collect uh, soils under each of the patch in each site. Um, and uh, also I collect some plant samples for plant ID because I have no idea about Australian plants. <laughs> <laughs> And then I take all these soils back into the lab. I conduct lab work on 600 soils from these 150 sites and uh, uh, tree, shrub, grass, and uh, open patches. And um, I conduct, uh, I assess the soil pH EC. It's a, a basic chemical property of the soil. And uh, also uh, I measure the soil infiltrability. That's a measure to see how quick the water can infiltrate through the soil. And uh, also I uh, assess the level carbon of the soil to see the carbon stock of the soil. Uh, and uh, also the soil enzyme, it's a proxy to see uh, how quick the soil can decompose this, this organic matter. And uh, then I extract the soil DNA uh, from the soil. And the soil DNA can tell us about the soil biodiversity such as how much bacteria, fungi, nematodes in the, are in the soils. So totally, I have done 3,000 laboratory tests and I spent uh, 1,200 hours in the lab. So that's basically the first three years of my PhD, yeah. <laughs> so my first study is to see how the tree structure would change as uh, the environment had getting drier. So changes in tree structure, such as their Canopy, their height, their stem can reflect how they interact with the environment. Um, for example, the height of the tree can reflect uh, the ability of tree to get uh, the light results and also the ability of tree to escape fire if the fire is at the underground. Uh, and the uh, canopy size of the trees uh, can reflect uh, how much they can intercept the rainfall and uh, the ability to provide the uh, habitat for our all the animals. Uh, and the stem diameter of the trees is directly related to the timber production. So theoretically, under the dry conditions, I know uh, we probably would know the tree would grow shorter because they do not have the uh, resource to support them to grow very tall. And uh, also, they might uh, grow thicker, become thicker in stems because thicker stem can help them to piping up more water. Then they can get more water results under the limited drying conditions. And also, they might also become wider in canopies because wider canopy can help them to uh, intercept more rainfall and uh, accumulate more water results to support their grow growth. So which way will our Australian trees choose? Um, to answer these questions, I explore all my data on the tree structure and uh, across all the 6,000 trees I surveyed. We, we can find that. The, the first plot at the top right, uh, top left corner is the tree height. We can see as the aridity increase, that means the environment is getting drier. Uh, imagine we are from Sydney to Tullabara. So the tree height is declined, which means generally as uh, in under dry climate, trees will grow much shorter. And uh, we see the stem diameter is kind of pre pretty much very stable. It does not change much. 
uh, but the canopy diameter of trees is slightly increased. So, which means under the dry climate, generally our Aussie plants will grow shorter in height and slightly wider in canopies. But is that uh, uh, suitable for all the tree species? No, because different uh, tree genera actually choose different uh, strategies. So we can see the for eucalypts and the clusters, uh, they tend to become wider in canopies. Therefore, under the ground conditions, they are more likely to intercept more rainfall to help them grow. But for our acacia, it tends to become the thicker in stem to increase their uh, water transporting ability. And uh, for our acacia arena, it did not change much. So what does this? What do these changes mean for our human? So because changes in tree structure direct, directly relate to how much product they provide to us. Uh, for example, as the climate getting drier, uh, our trees will grow shorter in height, and some trees will get uh, wider in canopies, and some trees will get uh, thicker in stems. The bad news of this is that we will have less timber production and the future climate change. And also our toilet paper will still out of stock even after the pandemic. But don't worry, we still have some good news. The wider canopies can provide a very good habitat for our Aussie uh, flora and the animals. And uh, also the thicker stems can help trees to against the disturbance so they might be able to survive the bushfire next time. So now we have known how the tree structure changes. So where uh, will the special distribution of trees also changes as environment are getting drier? So imagine if we are uh, flying a drone uh, uh, above the woodland, or, or imagine you are uh, at a plane, you're flying through the woodland. So we can see uh, their special distribution at the, uh, from the over to the top. In the humid uh, woodland, the, all the trees is kind of generally very dense and uh, kind of randomly distributed. But as we, as the environment getting drier, we go to the arid woodland. So, will the trees become distant from each other and become more sparser, or they are actually more relatively more close to cluster to each other? So to to attest to this, I plotted the spatial distribution of the trees in each of the site in humid, dry sub-humid, semi-arid and arid area. And from left to right, aridity is increased. So imagine we are going from Otali to Tupperboro. So we can see basically in humid and dry sub-humid, uh, these trees are generally random distributed. You couldn't see uh, like a very clear pattern. But uh, in arid area, you can see, although the trees tree density is declined, but uh, these trees are actually kind of more close together, getting clustered. And uh, also, uh, besides their special distribution, uh, we also find the tree, the composition of trees also changed. So the different uh, color of the points rep represent different species. So from in the humid and dry sub humid area, the green points is the dominant species, that is the uh, eucalypt. And we probably can see a couple of like purple red points that's uh, acacia and the clusters. But uh, in semi arid area, we can find the red points actually dominant in the community. So that is a, a classic uh, clusters stand we would find in the bush. And uh, interestingly, as we we'll go to the arid area, all other species just disappear and just the left eucalypts uh, dominant in the community. So changes in this uh, special distribution of plants um, would uh, uh, mean that uh, under the dry future, our uh, vegetation would grow more clustered together, just like this picture. We can see all the trees, grass crops are actually clustered to a certain patch, and they will only kind of grow in the certain patch. And this will result in a patchiness landscape. Uh, it's a picture taken from the airplane. So, and we can see the green is all the vegetation patches. 
you can see they're actually kind of in a like a strip or tiger pattern. So with the vegetation patches is uh, interspaced by the fire soils. And a, a typical example in Australia is a mocha grove we would see in the outback. So generally the mocha grove is act as a sink for the resources. So it can uh, catch all the uh, water nutrients that wash off from the fire soils and accumulate it underneath themselves. So this makes them to have more and more resource underneath. And then they can support uh, more and more uh, plant growth and also uh, habitat for the native animals. So besides plants, I also uh, look at how the soil resource under these plants changes under the dry climate. Um, so um, for woody plants, because it has very large canopies and a thick growth compared to grasses, so it uh, has the ability to accumulate more resources, uh, uh, such as they can trapling more soil particles, uh, intercept more rainfall, and uh, uptaking more nutrients by their roots. Um, therefore, there, there is generally more soil results, such as more uh, soil moisture and more soil nutrients uh, under these uh, woody plants. And this phenomenon is called uh, the Fortel Island effect. So, which means the uh, there is more fertile soils under the vegetations. Um, the fertile island effect is very important in our Australian dwellings because our Australian dwellings is very infertile and very water limited. If there is a patch that have so many nutrients and so many water, it will be a hot spot for all the ecological activities. And uh, for example, this picture we took in high, and we can see generally all the resources or all the plants is uh, accumulated uh, around these large shrub patches. And uh, this result of the shrub grow very well and become very tough. And uh, in this picture, my colleague is actually standing on the top of the shrubs. So which is very amazing. So and from this, we can see how important the, the hotel island is to us. And because we have known that uh, plant structure and their special distribution special distribution changes under the dry climate. And this will largely affect how the soil move from the uh, buyer interspace to the vegetation. And it's probably will affect the fertile island effect that we focus. And to test that, I first to test whether the fertile effect is a general thing. Uh, oh, too fast. Yeah whether the fertile island effect is a general thing across the New South Wales. So I, uh, to do that, I choose uh, seven soil attributes that relate to soil results, such as infiltrability, it relates to the ability of soil to monitor water, level carbon soil enzyme and litter, it relates to the nutrition cycling in the soil, and uh, plant cover, plant richness, and biocrust at the end of story. Uh, it, uh, uh, it represents the ground story cover. And uh, I calculate the difference between the between soil and the vegetation and the soil in the open intense space to see that difference. And uh, the value above this zero line means there is a greater resource under this vegetation. And below this red line means there are less uh, results under the vegetation. And I would probably say, generally, lots of the attributes is above the zero line. It means there is more uh, greater soil resource under the vegetation, except for biocrust, because biocrust have high competition with the shrub. So this means the photo airline effect is a very general thing out in our New South Wales. So the next step, so the next step, I look at how the Fertile island effect change as uh, environment get environment getting drier, and I find that uh, as we move from humid to arid area, there will be more so soil infiltrability means more soil moisture, level carbon, litter, and the plant richness under these vegetations. So, which means uh, the fertile island effect will become stronger under the drier environment.
And also, I want to know which one does best? Does tree or shrub or grass, which one does best in, in the fertile island effect? And uh, I uh, find that So I find that, oh, sorry. Uh, so I find that basically there is more soil resource accumulated under the trees. And especially there is more uh, soil infiltration. So means more soil moisture and litter accumulated under the trees than under shrub and grass. And that's basically what we see in the bush. Uh, so uh, in the Otal Park, so uh, probably we can remember the, the soil use underneath this vegetation is pretty much the same in the open interspace in terms of uh, the litter and the, uh, the plants on the ground. But as we go uh, place kind of uh, in relative arid areas such as bird, and we can see the picture, um, Mainly, these litters and the plants are accumulated under these trees. Uh, and in the open in the space, they're just the uh, red soils. And this pattern become more uh, significant as we go to extremely arid areas, such as the Stern National Park. Stern National Park only have like a couple of trees, but uh, just uh, the couple of trees, the litter and all the results are actually just uh, underneath these couple of trees. So this means under the future dry climate, these trees will become a very important sink for the soil resource, which will support our plants and animals. So we do need to protect our trees, don't cut them. So besides changes in plants and the soils, we're also interested in how the biodiversity will change under the dry climate. So biodiversity, including the above ground of Biodiversity, such as, such as plant diversity, the diversity of shrubs, uh, grass, and uh, trees. And it also includes the below ground soil biodiversity, which is often we didn't see that. So it's uh, like the diversity of the lintel bacteria, fungi, protist, and nematodes. And uh, uh, ecologists find that often a great amount of biodiversity is uh, equal to a great amount of ecosystem function and service they can provide to our humans. Because uh, different species, they actually play, uh, play a unique role in the ecosystem. However, as our environment is going from the coast to the desert, uh, the ecosystem is changing from the forest to woodland to shrub and to desert. So, well, greater biodiversity is still equal to greater function. And uh, also, well, the planet diversity and the soil biodiversity, they, they are equal important in the ecosystem, or they are not. So, uh, take these questions. We, we use the uh, field survey data and our soil micro data to test this. And uh, we find that in forest, in forest, ecosystem functions is only relate to tree diversity, but not soil diversity. So uh, this probably because the in forest, the trees is the major uh, biotic component in the ecosystem. It controls uh, how much carbon it uh, squeezed from the atmosphere and how much litter it provides to the soil. So greater tree diversity uh, is increased uh, carbon cycling and uh, decomposition process in the forest. However, greater diversity not means greater of anything because we find there is less so stability and uh, greater trade diversity. Why is that? Uh, so, uh, because on the soil surface, the soil stability is stable by the lintel biocrust and uh, the lintel ground story plants. But our tree species is highly high, uh, is very strong competitor, competitor to this uh, biocrust and uh, small plants. So if there is more tree diversity, that means there will be less ground star recovery and uh, biocrust. So uh, that's why we generally see there is only litter on the ground in the bush uh, around the coast. Uh, so that is why it's uh, less soil stability. 
But in no forest, such as the uh, woodland in semi-arid and arid, uh, arid regions, we find that ecosystem functions only relate to the soil biodiversity, not the tree diversity. Tree biodiversity. That's because uh, environment is getting much drier compared to the forest. So the trees actually very sparse and uh, they may not play that important role in the ecosystem. And uh, now it's a chance for the soil, soil engineers to control the ecosystem. So, and we find that the more soil biodiversity can enhance the organic matter decomposition. So because it's there, because it means there is more bacteria, fungi, nematode, different uh, species to decompose these different uh, organic matters. And uh, apart from that, we would look at how the specific taxa affect specific functions. For example, for the trees, we look at uh, Acacia, Alocasia, Arena, Cactus, and Eucalypts. And we find that in forests, uh, Acacia and Alocasia, Arena uh, uh, can, enhance, uh, can increase the carbon cycling. While Cactus, it uh, enhances nutrition cycling and uh, soil stability, but uh, it uh, decreases our decomposition process. And uh, for the Eucalypts, the dominant species are across our gradient. It actually did, do not affect the soil functions. It's a very interesting. So it means even, even if the tree diversity is increased the soil ecosystem functions, actually different species is play a different role. Some may increase and some may decrease. And also the same thing for the, uh, for the soil biodiversity. We look at the bacteria, fungi, invertebrates, and protists. We find that uh, a great abundance of bacteria can in increase the decomposition process, and uh, a greater abundance of invertebrates can increase the, the plant biomass. But uh, a greater uh, protist actually reduce the carbon cycling, and it's probably because the protist is a prediction a pre uh, prediction on the bacteria and the fungi. So the more protist that you have, the actually the less bacteria and fungi is in the in the soil biome so there there is less uh, carbon cycling in the ecosystem Jane, yep. so, uh, just go back to the slide i have one question yep. can you explain the role of fungi and the effects of fungi here because it's yeah oh uh, yeah so from here we actually didn't find any evidence of the impact of fungi on the soil functions. And uh, we think it's, it might uh, have something to do uh, the type of the organic matter that the fungi mainly consuming on. Because bacteria and the fungi, they actually target on different uh, type of organic matters. So uh, I think that um, might have something to do with their particular job in the ecosystem. But because I'm not a microbiologist, so that's just uh, like a um, the guess, a guess of the reason. Yeah. yeah, I think if people have like more professional background, may have some good ideas. On it. Yeah. So what does the difference between forest and non-forest mean to our real life? So it means uh, in forest, trees is play an important role in the ecosystem. Therefore, uh, tree planting programs such as the uh, uh, plant of the for plant of the planet or trailing tree project is very important uh, to restore the uh, forest ecosystem to restore their functions. But in no forest, actually, the soil uh, biomes that such as the bacteria, fungi, so animals, they are the major uh, player in the ecosystem. So in this in, in no forest. Um, Planting more trees is not a very good solution to the ecosystem because tree may not play an important role in the ecosystem. And also uh, planting trees, we know it's consuming lots of water, which is a very limited result in our uh, outback. So uh, conservation strategies such as uh, uh, reducing grazing and uh, uh, stop, uh, stop uh, agriculture or 
uh, stop uh, or reduce the land use intensity, all these measures that can uh, protect our valuable soils and uh, help the soil microbes. And uh, these measures are will be the good option in the non-forest ecosystem. Okay, so come to the end. So basically my PhD project answers how the plant soil and biodiversity they change under the future dry climate. And we have like three take, take home messages. So as climate getting uh, as the future climate getting drier, our Australian trees will get a shorter in height and some trees will become wider in canopies and some trees will become thicker in stem. And especially they will be more clustered together. And also there will be more results accumulated under this vegetation, especially the trees. And uh, we also find that the tree and the soil biodiversity, they are not play an equal role. The trees are more important in our forest. That's why we need to protect our forest. But uh, soils are more important in non-forest. That's why we need to protect our soil in the outback of the dry land. So in the future, if you find a figure trees, it's changing their size, getting fatter, and can all these soils enemies. Don't blame them. Them can be changed. So thank you. I want to thank you. thanks again for inviting me to come to this lecture and meet all the society people. And thanks again to funding my research. And I would like to thank my supervisor David and my colleague to help me conduct this project. And I also want to put my respect to traditional owners on the land where I conduct my project. Uh, and um, please feel free to ask your questions. Thank you. One point of time. Sorry. <laughs> that catches me, the, the indigenous practice of low temperature burning would seem to be a very positive one, keep, keeping the, uh, the forest down and, and, and uh, providing nutrients for the grasses. I mean, this was common practice over much of the continent, wasn't it? Um, Could I just, yeah. um, for people out there in Zoom land, Julian's asked a question about um, Aboriginal cultural practices of uh, cool burnings and um, uh, burning off the, the low um, ground cover. Yes, and providing nutrients to the soil at the same time. Does that fit in with your um, finding? Yeah, okay, thanks for the questions. So the Aboriginal uh, burning, yeah, <laughs> sorry. So the Aboriginal burning would provide this nutrients for uh, the soil microbes uh, that I highlighted in my result, which is very important for our dry land. Uh, but also, I want to say we can the burning, but uh, we can only limit it in the limited range because uh, if we burn all the forest, all the trade down in the outback, we will have like a dust storm, all the disasters. So my point in the outback is planting trees is not a good idea, but not a cutting trees is a, a, good, a good idea for the, uh, for the ecosystem. So if we have trees, we definitely will protect them, but uh, just uh, don't uh, put more energy in planting trees in this outback area because it may not get uh, what you want. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'll just ask Brian, are there any questions coming in on the uh, chat room? Uh, uh, we'll just take a question now from this uh, the hall audience. Um, I, I just want to um, ask you, you said you weren't so uh, familiar with the microbiome of the soil, but I understand that by protecting the microbiome of the soil, surely then you, once that's stable surely then you can start to introduce more tree species and have a, a, a symbiotic effect between the micro a strong micro uh, and a very microbiome in the soil and then and the trees and the shrubs as well yeah yeah and uh, that's a very good idea and uh, actually uh the microbiologists actually doing that kind of work and uh, i have a colleague that in usw she actually cultivated the cyanobacteria 
uh, this uh, soil microbes and cultivate in the lintel pellet that like a uh, like a medicine, like a drugs, and uh, put it into the field and uh, change the, which can change the soil and uh, help the plant germination. So if we know the uh, which microbe can help the uh, uh, plants grow in the outback, we definitely can help the, this restoration project to help the ecosystem in the outback. Yeah, thanks. Okay, there's um, no questions yet on the uh, chat line. Uh, if anybody out there would like to um, uh, ask a question, um, you may prefer to um, ask to unmute and read it out and we'll see how that goes. Um, in the meantime, is that somebody? Yeah. No. No. Okay. Um, okay, take another question. Graham, would you mind coming up here and um, asking a question? So that everybody out there in the room can hear it. Yeah, okay. Move in front of the right of the screen. Yeah. Chingy, I'm just interested. One of the big, um, when you're in Land Australia, one of the areas or type of tree you find in lots of uh, acacias, yeah. like the mulga. Yeah. And yet I was thought Mulga was a very arid country, but going in your data, acacias are not in the in the in the dry country, it's eucalypts. So I'm a little bit confused. Can you explain that please? Oh yeah, okay. So uh acacia is actually is definitely uh arid arid land uh, uh no mulga is actually an arid land symbol in our outback. But because my gradient is so long, it's went from a uh, place that have 2,000 millimeter rainfall to place maybe have like only 50 millimeter rainfall. So in my gradient, the Moga countries mainly occur in semi area, uh, area like uh, Koba, Berg, around that area. And my very dry site is actually in Tiberbara, the Stair National Park. If, if people have been there, you can see just uh, lots of sand dunes, only a couple of eucalypt tree grow uh, around the older river channel and that's that's it so that's why my data shows uh, in the end the eucalypt is only the winner in the arid area yeah thank you uh, we have one question here on the chat line from yeah. debbie how damaging are goats to destroying the soil crust Okay. How damaging are goats to in destroying the soil crust? Oh uh, yeah, it's a it's a really critical uh, question. So in the uh, as we know in the ridgeland, there are lots of there are lots of sheep, goats, cattle, and uh, the trampling of the fruit on the uh, soils can huge uh, can dramatically uh, broken the soil crust and uh, cause the soil erosions. And we actually, uh, with my supervisor, we conduct a global study of the uh, bio crust on the hydrological functions. And we find that bio crust is very important to uh, catch the uh, water and runoff and to help them infiltrate into the soils. And because the intensive grazing, um, the soil crust is destroyed by the sheep and cattle. Uh, so there will be more runoff erosion of the land, and also because uh, all the soil nutrients is actually only concentrated in the top five centimeter. So once the erosion happens, the good nutrients of the soil is being washed off. Then the land is very very infertile. So that's why lots of outback countries is look very dead, very sad. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I have one. Standard. <laughs> um, if we assume a, an environment without any feral animals there, yep. would these clusters expand? I mean, uh, they've been created at some stage yeah. because the soil nutrients better, yeah. would more trees grow and they would get bigger? Oh, you mean the cluster of the, the clusters? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for the question. So, uh, so for the yeah, it's a very interesting topic. So for the feral animals, uh, they do have the impact on our land. Uh, 
but the cluster of the vegetation is actually because the interact of the soil with the uh, uh, demographic of the this land because uh, the why the vegetation is clustered together because um, generally we would find that they actually cluster together in the low slope of the land like a downhill like mm -hmm. a, a tension and uh, all the uh, water and the nutrients flow to this area and uh, then the plants began to grow become a sink of the uh, nutrients and the water and uh, that's why it's uh, the vegetation grow kind of bigger but uh, uh, feral animals and also the livestock can destroy this cluster definitely because they would destroy the patches or eat the shrubs and uh, maybe let the uh, cluster become smaller and smaller so uh, but uh, simply remove all the feral animals i think uh, may may not be the be the huge impact on the cluster because actually the cluster is more affected by the livestock which actually eat and uh, have more intense impact on the vegetation i think uh, they remove all livestock may made the vegetation to grow more bigger and bigger mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. thank you thank you just uh, do i need to go out the front surely now well, people out there can't hear. Oh, right? Well, so just to say, really uh, what about uh, the problem of not so much feral animals, but this vast uh, amount of oceans of a well-known feral plant yeah. that we rely on, known as wheat. I mean, you go out to the west now, and it's it's wheat from uh, horizon to horizon. Yeah. This must be having a dramatic effect. Yeah. What what if, what uh, uh, wheat and rice and cotton, for that matter. Uh, this, for these farming techniques, are they affecting your your uh, findings, do you think? Uh, so mean the invasive plants. Invasive plants plant. such as wheat. Yeah. We, we think it's wonderful. We make an awful lot of money out of it. But yeah. it's invasive. It's an invasive feral plant. Yeah. So uh, thanks for the question. So yeah, we do see a lot of weeding at the outback and it's a uh, uh, like a huge of land being cropped and put out lots of wheat. And uh, I would say the wheating is do very good for the um, livestock, but uh, it may not be a, a long-term strategy or it may not be a sustainable thing for our ecosystem because we, we know our outback is very infertile and water limited and uh, we need pumping the groundwater to support uh, this weeding. And, uh, so as the time going on, if the ecosystem do not have enough resource to put in, so the weeding actually uh, kind of like, uh, their, uh, their production is kind of decline. And also, as you said, because the weeding is actually kind of one species to the, in the whole ecosystem. So it's actually very dangerous for the, uh, like the food web or the like the one species it might have very low resilience to the disturbance so uh, such as uh, if there is an insect out outbreak or a fire then the whole thing just uh, destroy and uh, our e ecosystem just become all the biases again so i think uh, weeding is a uh, uh, option for the farmers but also um, Cutting all the trees for weeding, I don't think it's a good option in the long term if you still want to feed your next generation. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll take a question from. Uh, this is from Brett and Deb. Yeah. Um, down south coast. How many different vegetation communities did you sample across the range of your study area, i.e. How many different types of moist forest did you sample? So, so uh, across all my gradient, I sampled uh, 150 sites. So, and uh, in each site there is, um, but generally there would also be uh, like a, a tree patch, a shrub patch, grass, and it's an open inner space with annual plants. So generally, I would say six. 100 vegetation community, but I don't think that's that's all across my gradient. There definitely be more because 
I'm just uh, kind of sampling along the gradient. So there definitely be more vegetation community across the gradient. And uh, for the um, humid forest, uh, I sampled the city sites because um, if we can, uh, we, if we can go back to the slide, uh, sorry. So this slide, if we can see from the slides, the blue area is the humid site and the green is the dry and humid. And we can see they are actually, especially they are very narrow compared to the whole gradient. So I sample only 30 sites in each area. But because the semi area area, so the, all of the yellow yellow part is very big in the New South Wales, and uh, here I sample the uh, 60 sites. So this is to make it especially more evenly distributed uh, along the gradient. Yeah, thank you. Next. I'm still trying to formulate my question, but, yep. um, oh, sorry. but historically um, we've had bilbies yep. burrowing animals in the yep. soil, yep. and then we had rabbits. Yep. We lost the bilbies, and I guess we're losing the rabbits from viruses and things like that. I'm wondering if burrowing, the absence of burrowing animals, has had any effect on on um, you know the arid areas reducing. Um, permeation of water and that sort of oh, thing yeah. and yeah. Whether, whether you get a maybe go with that yeah okay thank, so, you. thank you very much it's a very good question uh, so uh, burying of the animals such as bilby uh, kinder rabbit uh, they have very important uh, uh, role in our arid outback because uh, if uh, because when they burying there is a kind of a hole on the ground and uh, uh, if you remember my result of the cluster vegetations, so uh, the the holes will actually also at a sink of the uh, water and the nutrients when the rainfall coming in from the uphill to the downhill. So the the hole actually collect uh, moisture and nutrients, and also it's also collect uh, seeds when it's wind blowing. The seeds will go into the hole and also litter. So it's actually like a like a bowl in the arid area. It's collecting all these different things, and uh, we also have an experiment in the metaclips for uh, how the digging digging mammal would affect the ecosystem. We find that the digging holes uh, after three months is actually full of the litters and some dead insects, and some of them also germinating some lintel plants. So the uh, the a burrowing mammals is very important for our area land because they can create a, a lintel patches for the hot spot for the uh, ecological activity to be begin. So uh, the reduction of the burrowing mammals would definitely be a loss to our ecosystem functions in our outback. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Yeah. One, one question. Yeah. Big question. Uh, okay. uh, Jinghee, uh, yeah. a wonderful presentation, and um, you've, you've, you've indicated to us that uh, what uh, possibly will happen because of climate change. In all your studies that you've done, have you come up with some ideas of what we could do to actually mitigate that climate change? Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks, it's a very good. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, the answer to this question is uh, like a big mission. Yeah, but from my from my uh, time. Time. yeah <laughs> from my PhD project. So on um, in the last part, uh, we we talk about uh, the in, uh, the impact of tree diversity and the soil diversity on the different ecosystem. So as we said, in the forest, 
trees are very important for the ecosystem function. And uh, so globally, there is lots of planting tree projects, like a, a tree link tree project uh, to planting trees. And uh, except for the benefits on ecosystem function, planting trees also uh, squeeze more greenhouse gas and CO2. And uh, so they uh, store more carbon underneath. So it's actually a way to mitigate the climate change. Um, and also um, in the outback, in the arid area, because the soil biodiversity is very important for the ecosystem. So uh, what I generally, uh, what I suggest is uh, reducing the disturbance on the soil, such as reducing clogging the soil, reducing converting the land to the agriculture, because in that way, uh, when my loss the uh, soil biodiversity and uh, in and at the same time when uh, there would be uh, like the carbon stored in the soil would be just the image to the atmosphere just to uh, make our climate change much worse so so from my pitched project I simply put just uh, planting trees in forest and protect soil in no forest that's all thank you <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you Jingyi I think we'll um, call it a day. And what I'll do is ask Adrian to come up again. And rather than challenge you, he'll thank you. Oh. <laughs> just, uh, before you yeah. do, sorry, I just want to um, belatedly welcome David Eldridge, uh, Kingy's uh, supervisor. I yeah. omitted that uh, welcome this evening. Uh, David's come along. Um, I think he's come back home, actually. Um, he's he was a member of Oatley Forum Fauna from 63 to... 63 to 73? To 73, that sort of period, a decade ago. He worked Last for uh, Soil Conservation <laughs> Service and uh, he lived at Peakhurst. And uh, so he's, he's come back home tonight, had dinner in the pub. And uh, so we, well, we hope yeah. you're enjoying <laughs> your, your return well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. to this. And thank you for... Um, coming along with Jingy uh, tonight. Thanks, Dave. Thank so, um, as we've already said, Jingy, a wonderful yeah. presentation. Really, we've enjoyed it. It's pretty. We couldn't have more people here to enjoy uh, what you've said tonight and learn from you. Um, we do have a number of tree planting projects in place. Um, you'll be very pleased to hear yeah. and you're, in your short time in Australia. You'll yeah. be most welcome to join us. Well, in the meantime, you. both for you, David, also for oh, you, uh, just in case you've forgotten how to plant trees, oh, we've yeah. just got a few little wow. samples from uh, Oakley Floor and Fauna. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thanks, King, you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Fantastic. I just say that the audience was bigger than this. We had another 11 people on the Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Good. Thanks, everybody online. Uh, you're, welcome. <laughs> yeah. you're welcome to stay for our general business section, yeah. which we're moving into now. Or, yeah. And uh, or, um, yeah, sure. Yeah. And also, can Kim note to say that we may have a little work for you to do because. Um, We'd love you to come back and look at some of the trees in more detail in our in uh, uh, our local government area. Oh, that's right. right. Yeah. yeah, and do some measurements for us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. we'll, let you, we'll let you know. Yeah, thanks. Oh, they give you a thank hard you. time. Oh. <laughs> thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, just a quick reminder to people, uh, most of our talks this year are on our YouTube channel. Just scroll down to and click on the button on the web, website homepage and you should get to it. And if you subscribe, you won't miss out on future videos. So I believe you can subscribe to our YouTube